Hi everyone, thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Liz, I'm an Associate Director at PacBio. Today I'm really happy to join our guest speaker, Nathan from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, who's gonna talk about Mossy single cell on Revio. So this portion of the talk is pre-recorded. At the end of this recording, we will have a live Q&A. So first I'm going to give a 10 minute introduction to Single cell isoseq and MOSSEQ. So, the reason people use long reads for single cell isoform sequencing is because short reads cannot capture the whole transcript. However, isoforms, not genes, are often the biological drivers of disease and biology. Just to show you schematically what this looks like, when you're doing single cell RNA sequencing with short reads, you are mostly getting a partial view of the gene of 100 bases with, on the three prime end with UMI and barcode information. Using single cell isoseq with PacBio HiFi reads, you get the entire full length isoform with single cell tag information. As an example of why showing isoforms are important to disease, the BCL gene creates two different isoforms. One promotes cancer the other suppresses it. HiFi data is uniquely capable for single cell RNA sequencing. As you can see schematically, compared to short reads, it only offers you incomplete gene information. Whereas compared to other long reads, there are fewer usable reads and correction is often needed or orthogonal data is needed for error correction due to lower accuracy. With PacBio, you can get full length isoform information with high accuracy. So in the following few slides, I wanna show some vignettes of previous single cell isoseq studies. The first is the authors applying single cell isoseq to aging down syndrome brains. What they showed in this figure here were that four genes implicated in aging down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease shows different isoform proportions. For example, the bin one gene in the middle, these colored bars are different isoforms and each bar represents a different cell type. And you can see that in different cell types, the isoforms have different proportions. They also found that microglia showed the highest proportion of novel isoforms. They were also able to identify differential isoform usages in Down syndrome and Alzheimer's related genes. In another example, the researchers applied targeted bulk isoseq and single cell isoseq to look at the P10 gene in a pediatric patient. Using exon sequencing, they identified that the P10 gene has two variants, one on exon 5 and one on exon 9. Using targeted bulk isoseq, they found that the two variants were actually in trans. Further, when following up with targeted single cell isoseq, they were able to show that the exon 5 variant and the exon 9 variant isoforms have cell type specificity. In this very recent preprint, the authors applied a concatenation approach to increase the read depth of single cell isoseq to 12,000 UMIs per cell for about 2,000 cells. These are ovarian cancer patient samples. In total, they captured over 150,000 isoforms of which 30% were novel isoforms. Using mat matching short and long read data, they show that they can achieve equivalent cell clustering. Two other vignettes were of interest. One is that they had patient matched bulk DNA sample from which they called mutations. In the figure in the middle panel above, they showed that the germline variants shown in the blue dots are spread across different cell types. Whereas for the somatic mutation shown in the red dots was only found in the cancerous cells. They also showed that the cancer cells express twice as many unique isoforms as other cell types, where the unique isoforms were driven by neojunctions, the use of novel donor and acceptor sites. Further, they found isoform-specific IGF gene usage in the cancerous cells. The purple lines there show the isoforms expressed in the cancerous cell type. They call this the class II isoforms. 
And then the yellow lines below show the fibroblast microenvironment isoforms. They call these the class one isoforms. Finally, the single cell isoseq data revealed a patient and cancer specific fusion gene. Importantly, when looking at the matching short reads, they actually found that the short reads were misclassified. Because of their short read length, they did not get classified as a fusion gene, rather were attributed all to the TESPA1 gene. And finally, let's talk about concatenation. The previous publication I just showed you is predated the MOSIC method, but overall the concept is the same. MOSIC is a throughput increase method that can concatenate smaller amplicons into larger DNA inserts. This is doable for cDNA because most transcripts are about one to two kilobases, and our hi-fi read lengths can be up to 15 to 20 kilobases. By concatenating smaller amplicons into larger inserts, we can increase the throughput. The author showed with matching short and long read data that we can recapitulate the same cell types. But more importantly, we can also see cell type specific isoform expression. In this case, the different isoforms of CD45. The MOSSEQ is now a pack bio kit called the MOSSEQ for 10X Single Cell 3 Pump Kit. It is compatible with cDNA generated from the 10X chromium, 15 to 75 nanograms of cDNA, and is suitable for a cell library of 3,000 to 10,000 cells. It takes two days for library preparation and is sequencing ready. It is compatible with SQL2 and 2E and Revio systems. And our SmartLink generates gene and isoform count matrix that is compatible with tertiary tools such as Surat, Scambi, and Kana. And now I'll welcome Nathan to present his part of the talk. Great, Liz, thank you so much. Um, first, I'd like to thank you and uh, PacBio for providing early access to the MassSeq uh, kit and Revio sequencing, uh, and the opportunity today to tell you about how we are using these exciting new technologies to decode clonal evolution from long read data. My lab develops computational tools for integrative genomics analysis with an emphasis on understanding the role of alternative splicing in diverse diseases, but with a particular emphasis on hematological malignancies, in which normal lineage trajectories are co-opted by malignant gene programs to promote transformation. One such hematological malignancy is myelodysplastic syndromes, or MDS, which are characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis, resulting in bone marrow failure, morphologic dysplasia, as shown here on the right, acquired cytogenetic abnormalities in approximately 50% of cases, and clonal hematopoiesis in, in as many as 90% of, of MDS cases. Most cases of MDS uh, are de novo, so they're not predisposed by an existing disease, and they typically occur in patients 70 and over. Uh, however, what is particularly interesting is, is close to or over 50% of these cases are associated with mutations in a particular class of proteins called splicing factors, which I'll talk more about in a moment, uh, with the tendency for these MDS patients to progress to acute myeloid leukemia in about 30% of cases. MDS represents an important system for us to understand how competitive clones evolve and gain dominance during therapy, which can result in secondary AML as denoted here, which is, is, is indicated here as SAML. Uh, this is concordant with clonal expansion, which the percentage of malignant blasts which within the marrow increases. While we can partially understand clonal evolution from bulk genetics and phylogenetic analyses of such data, as shown in this type of plot here, this fish plot, these predictions are as as uh, these are predictions, as we are not directly genotyping individual cells, which can include hundreds of possible genetic alterations in a single individual. Further, which cell types these mutations are arising in can also can also be distinguished by these bulk genomics approaches and even most single cell assays 
which are limited to transcriptomic input outputs, but not mutational readouts. An important readout of possible clonal differences is alternative splicing, as I mentioned before. Shown here in leukemia, if we look at the predominant molecular markers of genetically defined subtypes of AML, we see that splicing often vastly improves subtype delineation over gene expression alone. In particular, on the left, we see clear splicing events that separate out AMLs with splicing factor mutations, and including other fusions, such as oncofusions as well. Um, and importantly, these same subtypes are poorly distinguished on the right just by gene expression alone, as you can also see through the supervised class classification sensitivity and specificity analysis on the right. For these reasons, we would ideally want to perform single cell assays in which we can track clones based on their genetics, gene expression, splicing, and even cell surface markers to understand cell state-specific molecular impacts of these mutations. One possible way to do this now is with new multimodal single cell assays such as MASSI, which Liz introduced you to a minute ago. These assays enabled you to simultaneously profile mutations in individual cells in an unbiased manner, alternative splicing, and cell states. This, in this approach in principle should enable us to impute clonal cell states from diverse sources of data. To understand if this is possible, we collaborated with scientists at PacBio to leverage the new MassSeq kit in conjunction with standard 10x genomic single cell profiling and long read Revio sequencing applied to a single MDS patient at multiple time points of therapy. Shown here, our collaborator, Amy Desern, selected a single patient with low risk MDS, initially based on pathology, but with later determined high risk based on, on molecular characterization. Uh, which underwent, underwent standard care therapy, azacitidine treatment for six cycles, also called HMA therapy. Um, HMA therapy in this individual failed, and this patient later progressed to secondary AML, but is actually now doing well following uh, standard of care therapy for AML, which is venetoclax plus azacitidine therapy. Importantly, Amy obtained genetics using targeted sequencing panel at these different time points, which shows substantial differences in the frequency of well-established MDS driver, muta driver gene mutations, such as RUNX1, SRSF2P95, SRSF2 is a splicing factor, CEPBP1, ASXL1, and a new clone that emerged uh, post-therapy in uh, the gene B-Core. To understand the molecular and genetic impacts at a single cell level in this patient, Sean Zhang, a postdoctoral research fellow in the Lee Grimes lab that I co-supervise here at Cincinnati Children's, performed multimodal profiling with 10X genomics 3' prime version 3.1 chemistry on bone marrow biopsies collected at each one of these major time points of therapy. Importantly, this allowed us to derive a single library from which we aliquoted material for both short read site-seq sequencing. And here site-seq enables us to, to profile short mRNA fragments of 150 nucleotides, as well as cell surface antibody-derived tags um, within the same cells. In parallel, and exactly in those exact same cells, we're able to perform long read mass-seq with Revio sequencing. Here we profiled uh, each one of these time point samples where we, we looked at CD34 uh, uh, enriched cells uh, with 80 to 100 million reads per capture, capturing uh, 4.5 uh, thousand UMIs, 4 to 5 thousand UMIs per cell, uh, and on average obtained uh, transcripts of, of a kilobase in length. To inform which cell populations are present in normal marrow in parallel, we collaborated with Gabriel Guiar at John Hopkins to isolate the same cell populations from normal age, map do age match donor controls um, to create a reference map of hematopoiesis. We annotated these populations based on previous analyses us and others in the field have done uh, to identify which are the predominant normal populations, which we can then leverage to transfer these labels to the MDS samples. Uh, to understand how they, these, the, frequ how these, uh, the frequency in these populations change during transformation to AML. 
what we find is that we have highly accurate estimates of gene expression, which are only diff which are only differ basically twofold between mass seq and nova seq. Further, we observe the same pattern of gene expression in specific cell lineages, such as those in hematopoietic stem cells, such as HLF, which is shown on the left of that plot, and DNTT in lymphoid myeloid progenitors, um, as well as isoform expression by mass shown here on the bottom, um, that can be validated using site-seq shown here in the top for the exact same isoforms. So here we're looking at protein level expression on the cell surface of the cells inferred by site-seq. Down here, we're looking in the same cells, uh, looking at the full length isoforms uh, that are, can be identified that have exons that match to these two diff these different RNA isoforms. This gave us some strong confidence that this platform is initially working to accurately detect both gene expression and isoform differences. However, an important requirement for us is that we can accurately measure single cell genotypes from this assay. To validate, we performed a parallel targeted cell, single cell sequencing assay called GOT, or genotyping of transcriptomes from Dan Landau's group, which matched to observe genotype calls from MassSeq when we look at a single mutation in the gene SRSF2. Here denoted, the mutant cells are denoted in red, and the wild type cells are denoted in blue with either GOT or MassSeq. Indeed, we see a large proportion of cells genotyped by both assays. The major difference here being um, that the mass seq is unbiased and not targeted, allowing it to look at more mutations than those that you would normally be able to use, look at with these targeted approaches. More specifically, we are able to detect other mutations in this patient, namely RUNCS1, in which the mutation is 5KD from the poly A site. So this is something you wouldn't be able to detect with a standard 10X library using Novacy. Uh, we're also able to detect uh, rare mutations, uh, although these should be more frequent, in CEPEP1, ASXL1, and BCOR, which emerges post-therapy. Uh, what's particularly interesting about this is although this mutation was only observed post-therapy, we're able to identify rare, rare mutations within this gene at that exact position uh, that correspond to the later uh, uh, um, therapy-resistant malignant clone that only arises and is only detected post-therapy. Finally, we designed an informatics workflow to quantify splicing differences from the isoform-level data in single cells by extracting individual exon-exon and exon-junction reads per cell across all samples for splicing calculation in our software Alt Analyze. Here, for example, if you take a single cell uh, and if you have three different isoforms expressed with different read counts over here indicated, you can then extrapolate which junctions are going to be present based on the sum of these junction counts across different isoforms for calculating uh, your or splicing inclusion values uh, or, or, intron, or intron reclusion values, or even alternative polyadenylation for these different, different isoforms. Examples of this, these, the, what you can find with this data when we look at actually these particular cell lineages with unique splice isoforms expressed are exons that are unique to, or largely unique to one particular cell state. So in this case, we're looking at hematopoietic stem cells in which in this gene MYL6, an exon is, is maximally only expressed in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, and only really detected infrequently in other lineages. Similarly, if you look at an alternative three prime splice site in the gene SCNA, you can see that it is uniquely detected really in these multi lin progenitor populations that we predict. We can identify these uh, uh, CD45R or PTPRC gene uh, isoforms, which again are uniquely expressed in MDP and LMPP, which matches what are shown in the, li the literature for the specific isoform. And we can see various different alternative promoters that are uniquely expressed in different cell lineages uh, that are only in one or a few cell states, uh, which potentially result in more improved markers than traditional gene expression-based markers in these cell populations. Having validated this platform, we really wanted to now evaluate how we can look into competitive clones and splicing impacts uh, at, at a very high resolution level that we weren't able to, detect, to do previously. And some particular questions that we wanted to ask is, is which clones exist and what are their roles in malignancy? Which gene and splicing programs arise from these clones? 
Um, and, and to do this, we really think the MassSeq protocol is really ideally suited to answer these questions. So instead of looking at the UMAP we previously showed you, we relayed out the coordinates with a U new UMAP in which was driven by gene expression differences in these populations. And as you can see on the right, cells, cells that were associated with the secondary AML in red were largely clustering together. Uh, Post-HMA therapy, which is the middle time point, are also overlapping with these secondary AML samples and partially with the MDS samples where the MDS really clustered out separately, suggesting that there really are strong cell state discrete differences, which may be impacted by different uh, clones that are present at different frequencies within these cell states. If we now overlay genetics from the mass seq that we detect uh, on top of these cells, we can also see that there is segregation of these mutations in the UMAP associated with these different cell populations, again, suggesting that there are different clonal cell states that exist in different cell populations. So for example, in red, we see SRSF2 mutant cells. In, orange, in yellow, we see wild type cells. In dark blue, we see RUNX1 mutant cells. In light blue, or we see aqua blue, we see SRSF2 and RUNX1 mutations. Uh, and in light green, which are hard to see here because they're rarely detected, we see BCOR mutations. Uh, and I'd like to note based on the right, what we, we know is that their frequency of these mutations is much higher than we're actually detecting by mass seq because some of these mutations are very distant from the poly A site and are many kV away. And so what we next asked is, can we actually impute clonality from these profiles that we can generate from these cells? In particular, if we have mutations and gene expression in the same cell, we can effectively learn who the nearest neighbors of those cells are within the entire data set and even reclassify clones potentially more accurately based on their global gene expression profiles. And so to do this, we used a, a prior uh, uh, cell reclassification strategy called Cell Harmony, cell harmony we re re previously published, uh, which is shown here on the right. Uh, and when we apply this workflow, we're able to identify, uh, in this case, 189 clonal cell states, among these data, which is, which is a large number, and we'll get to whether or not those are valid uh, soon, uh, but you can see that there is clear separation in this UMAP between different cells with different genotypes that exist within these discrete populations, uh, which really are, are what we were trying to go for and to extract meaningful, unique biology within different clonal populations uh, associated with different cell states. And I'd just like to note that one reason we believe that these, these clonal predictions are likely real is A, we, we did do gene perform gene expression analyses uh, with non-imputed and, and imputed clones and, and, and between mutant and wild type, and we saw similar gene expression differences in those populations. But importantly also, we see similar clonal frequencies to what we would expect based on the clinical genetic sequencing as we do in the impute, imputed VAF of, of these cells. Uh, without over predict without over predicting clones as far as we can tell. When we look at these data collectively, and here we're using something called a Sankey plot, and we can we can look at the genetics of each cell state or effectively predicted clones in combination with which cell types they're present in. And so for example, here on the left, we're looking at hematopoietic stem cells and MDS samples at, at diagnosis. We have SRSF2 mutants and wild type cells, the predominant populations. In the secondary AML, uh, these are only, you've, you've actually selected out all the wild type cells. In fact, most of the hematopoietic cells were, were, uh, were, were squelched in, uh, in post therapy. Uh, inversely, what you see is certain populations such as IG2 over here, uh, which are present uh, in the diagnostic sample, uh, but after therapy are effectively completely eliminated. Uh, this is in contrast to populations like LMPP, which are effectively a minor population in the MDS, but upon uh, post-therapy and secondary AML, these clones have substantially grown out. And so we now can see this B-core clone, which was present at, at very low frequencies, you can't even see it here, is now one of the dominant populations in the secondary AML sample, uh, even though these mutations really only exist in a very small subset of, of cells at diagnosis. Um, suggesting that this lymphoid myeloid priming progenitor population, or LMPP, uh, is particular interest from a, both a therapeutic perspective and for the perspective of understanding what is happening in these additional specific clonal populations. 
So one of the questions we have for this analysis is which of these clones are actually real and which are potentially artifacts of our analysis. And again, we have 189 putative candidate clones spanning 25 predicted cell states. These can theoretically be collapsed if you start to assume certain clonal models, uh, such as this, this mutation and this mutation are gonna co-occur within the same cell. And so we needed an approach to really understand which are likely the most durable or reliable cell populations based on statistical metrics. And so to do this, we applied a recent uh, computational strategy that we developed called SE Triangulate. This is a game theory driven approach uh, which uses a diverse number of machine learning stability metrics to infer which cell populations are real given multiple different uh, either resolutions of data or different uh, putative candidate clonal populations that are associated with different molecular measurements. Uh, in this case, we're looking at RNA, we're looking at splicing outputs, we're looking at ADTs, and we're looking at mutations. And so what's great about this program is it can consider all those modalities. It can consider all these alternative clusters, including the very low resolution cell type predictions and the clonal predictions. Uh, and with this game theory based strategy that's, that's highlighted here, we can integrate these data to find out what are the most stable populations in the end. And we perform this analysis, we find that it actually surprisingly, 147 out of 189 populations are durable that we initially predicted. What we find here is that there are surprisingly 147 clonal cell states which are deemed durable or reliable from SC triangulate out of the 189 that are predicted. This is somewhat surprising to us, um, but what you can see here is if you look on the right here, if we look at the association of which cell states were effectively merged or collapsed, you can see they're mostly occurring within the MDS or, or or diagnostic sample uh, in which either clones are joined based on having a common cell state and not having sufficient gene expression differences or these broader clonal models. What's interesting in particular is that we observe, uh, uh, we observe a lack of this merging over in the secondary AMLs, suggesting that really these, these different clones are resulting in durable gene expression differences post-therapy. Additionally, what SC Triangulate provides is it provides different uh, modality specific features that are contributing to different population identities uh, that are associated with uh, stability here. So for example, if we look at RNA contribution, gene expression contribution, we can see genes that are, genes that are uniquely expressed within ERP SRSF2 RUNX1 clones are uniquely defining this population most strongly. Uh, as well as, as this pre-B SRSF2 population of clones. Uh, conversely, if we look at splicing contribution, we see, for example, in the LMPP, you see B cores really driving splicing differences that are, are resulting in predominant markers that are being uh, detected by the program. And we look at cell surface ADTs, we see a diverse number of other rare populations which are uniquely defined by cell surface antigen expression, such as an MKP in the RUNX1 population, which might, might highlight uh, uh, cell surface markers, which we could later use to isolate these different populations. What we really wanna know, however, are what are the distinct genomic impacts in, in different competing MDS clonal populations? And so now here we're only focused on that LMPP population, and we're looking at two different time points. Here are the, the diagnostic MDS sample and the post-HMA therapy sample. And what we see is interestingly, there's very similar patterns of gene expression between these two time points in the different genotype clonal subsets. And, it, and interestingly, you see the same kinds of gene expression responses in some cases. For example, in this rare RUNX1 B core positive population, you see they're both enriched in uh, mitotic gene expression. Uh, uh, similarly, between these, uh, is, as well as in this B-core positive population, you see this more mature lymphoid program being induced within the B-core positive cells, which you also see post-therapy. Uh, and this is really uh, becoming much clearer post-therapy along with other gene expression changes that we're observing here. In addition to gene expression differences, we can look at alternative isoform different level differences in these populations, which highlight putative intriguing regulators that could be promoting oncogenesis or, or, cells or tumor cell or uh, MDS clonal survival. Uh, for example, if we look at this gene DUT in multi-LIN2 cells, we can see that there's this different, these different alternative promoter exons here 
uh, and where we're indicating alternative promoters here, we saw that with RUNX1, it's really not resulting in any alternative promoter differences versus wild type. However, when you have SRSF2 alone or SRSF2 in combination with RUNX1, you see this dramatic reduction in expression of this one exon here. You not only see this at the MDS sample, you see this post-HMA therapy, and to a lesser extent in the um, secondary AML sample. Conversely, we can look at another alternative promoter in the gene GSEN, also in LMPPs, and while we see an, a specific increase in the expression of this exon in the RUNX1 cells in MDS, as well as post-HMA, we see a loss of this exon in both the B-core and the B-core samples in both of these two time points. Uh, a slight increase or no difference in SRSF2, but again, when you have RUNX1 present, you have a dramatic increase in the expression of the same exon at these two time points of therapy. Uh, and so we really think this is opening up some really exciting opportunities to begin understanding, to start understanding what the role of these specific isoforms are and specific clonal populations and how these individually contribute to disease and potentially identify therapeutic targets that may be cell type specific. Our ongoing work is really focused on extending these analyses to both controls and later time points that we haven't profiled yet by MassSeq. Uh, and hopefully actually looking at novel mutations beyond those that were identified by the, the targeted clinical sequencing originally. Uh, we're also developing new methods to refine clonal genotype predictions. Uh, this is really our version one uh, uh, imputation method. And we, we think we're gonna have a couple different iterations of this method that we think could get better and better. Uh, and we wanna validate impact, uh, impacted splicing and gene programs in existing bulk MDS and AML data uh, to see how cell state specific splicing programs are reproduced uh, at the bulk level and, and further develop uh, and, and distribute supporting bioinformatics tools associated with these technologies. And finally, I'd just like to thank members of the, the Grimes Lab uh, who really drove the experimental work here, in particular Sean Zhang, who led, led these both, both the, the generation of the data and, and much of the analysis of the data members of my lab who developed the bioinformatics tools and develop and analyze these bioinformatics data, our clinical collaborators at John Hopkins and Yale, uh, and sequencing uh, uh, support from the University of, of Louisville and uh, Melissa Laird Smith's group, and, and of course, Elizabeth Sang uh, and, and colleagues at PacBio who gave us early access to these technology and who've extensively helped us with analyses along the way. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. So, uh, folks, if you have questions, please use the um, questions box. I do see already there's some questions, so I'll start with the ones that I see already. So I'm going to combine, I think, some of the first few questions together, Nathan, because I think they're kind of referring to your first section when you're like looking at what you can call with Mossy, right? You said like, hey, I was able to call the mutations. You also had the clinical sequencing results, which I believe are from genome. Um, and then also GOT. So I think that this is a this is a, a bundled question. First of all, someone wanted you to clarify what a GOT is, and yep. then uh, maybe well let's start with that, and then I will ask you my second question. Yeah. So so there are different ways to um, identify sequence mutations within individual cells, uh, both at the RNA level and at the DNA level. If you're looking at a taxi. Uh, these are targeted methods in which you are doing a sub-library amplification after you've generated your initial 10x library. Uh, the method specifically here is called genotyping of transcriptomes, which is from Dan Landau's group. And in that protocol, again, you're, you're targeting very specific mutations of interest. And depending on where that mutation is, you may have greater sensitivity to detect it and how well that gene is, is expressed. Um, you know, so if the gene is not expressed highly, you're going to have um, fewer RNAs to actually detect uh, accurately genotype those cells. Um, so, so those are definitely some challenges if you're only looking at RNA. Um, but yeah, in this case, the mutations that we were looking at uh, were initially coming from clinical targeted sequencing panels uh, for MDS and AML that were applied at John Hopkins. Got it. And then so continuing to kind of the second part of that question was someone asked, can you detect the mutations using MossSeq alone? Yeah, and so if we hadn't had the clinical genome sequencing, what we would probably do is something initially akin to what you do with targeted sequencing, where we'd have loci of interest um, or specific alleles of mutations of interest that we would go and look for. Uh, there are fusion calling algorithms for long-read data, as, as Liz can tell you more about, that you can detect in an unbiased way 
you know, oncofusions and structural rearrangements that are detected at the RNA level. Um, but yeah, if you if you don't know what you're looking for, there are a number of new long read uh, sequencing and, and bulk bulk based methods to identify uh, genomic m mutations variants in a de novo manner. Cool. Um, okay, and there are. I think this is maybe you already answered, but they're just basically concerned like, oh, what is the limitation of using just the RNA seq alone, like GOT or yeah. MOSC, rather than interrogating the genome? I think they're just saying like, can you? Does it mean you should? You don't need the genome interrogation. You don't need to call the genomic variants. Sorry, do you, in terms of genome, yeah. Sorry, I, I actually misinterpreted that. Could you repeat that one more time? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think what this person is saying, hey, if you can detect the mutations where you had a slide that showed yeah. that, hey, Mossy can detect all the muta driver mutations. I think they're asking, like, well, does that mean you don't need the kind of genomic variant calls? And I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no, because not everything is expressed in the transcript. Yeah, so 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 it's kind of two questions, right? Is one is is can you you know if you don't know what variants to detect, how how do you know which ones to go after? Mm -hmm. and, and that first question is really you know it's it's from it's, I'm sure there's actually good reviews out there that I'm less familiar with about what is the sensitivity to detect you know variants at the RNA level from versus uh, at the genomic level. But we've had a lot of great success with just doing variant calling from bulk RNA seq variants alone. Uh, and oh. so we've looked at, we look often at these bulk RNA seq cohorts, and uh, you know one one of the most interesting ones was you know we'd found the splicing defined phenotype in AML in, in this uh, this uh, cohort called Lucigene, and there was no mutant calls for these patients that that was consistent. And when when you know when we started running the you know GATK best practices for RNA seq on those samples, you know we had one mutation that clearly came up. It was a well-described mutation in that population. It was actually SRSF to P95, exactly like in these patients here. Uh, and it was just a variant that, for whatever reason, in the original exome, it was not at not sufficient depth that it was covered, but it was it was clearly detected. And so you can use these de novo RNA-seq variant detection pipelines. It's really just limited based on the depth of, of the capture. But as, as Liz pointed out, um, some mutations actually sit at different locations within the gene structure. And so, as I mentioned, the average transcript length with, with this protocol was 1 kb. Uh, Liz can probably clarify, I think that can be tweaked uh, based on how you generate your libraries. And we've, we've played with this a little bit, uh, or, or Sean in, in, in our group can, can comment on this a little bit more. Um, but depending on if you have a, a mutation that's many kb away from the uh, the alternative polyadenylation site, it may actually be better to use the five prime protocol. So I believe that there's a five prime based mass seq protocol that will come out. And if you if you apply that, you may actually have a better probability of detecting those mutations because the last those those last um, exons are very large in transcripts. Uh, the the yeah. whole three prime UTR untranslated region. Uh, so it's a yeah, large so region that you went through. Yeah. So maybe I'll add a little more color is that, you know, especially you show that you found the wrong swan mutation and you said it was five kilobases away from the poly yeah. site. And our current MOSI kit supports the three prom libraries generated from 10X. And there's some uh, known limitations to the 10X cDNA that tends to be a little shorter. And that means you will have a, a three prom bias. And I think what you're saying is like, yes, you were still able to occasionally see the 5KB, but there, there's a limitation. And I think that that actually points out to why in your talk, you said you're doing imputation on some of the clones because mm -hmm. you can't cover the entire transcript that has all the mutations. Okay. That's right. It, and, and it's likely, you know, it, you know the, the curious question here is there, there may be deeper mutations. There may be other mutations here that are playing really important critical roles here. Um, and so we're, we're also playing with looking at kind of ignoring the mutation level information and just just looking at the splicing, just looking at the gene expression, oh. and in some cases the cell surface ADTs, and then doing these kind of, you know, these uh, game theory based clustering methods to find out what are the most durable populations that we can then go back to and say, are there specific variants that are enriched in these populations? Uh, because for us, if you detect a variant that's somewhat meaningless, if it's if it's not previously known, but if mm -hmm. now you can prescribe a functional attribute to it, such as in this cell state, you know, you have an enrichment of this polymorphism uh, or, or this, uh, you know, this variant detected or, or rearrangement at the specific cell population, then you're nominating as a potential, you know, key, key mutation in, in cancer oncogenesis, in, in the oncogenesis, yeah. Cool. 
Um, so maybe I'll go for a, a, some very hopefully trivial technical questions before we expand back to the big picture. Um, a technical question for you was, how do you sequence SiteSeq and MossSeq for the same cells? Did you prepare a specific library to run in both approaches? Yeah, and so so the beauty of this uh, protocol, and and I'm not the experimentalist here, so I'm I'm doing the more of the bioinformatics side. So Liz is probably going to have to come in and correct some things I'm saying here. But but one single library is initially generated. So you you you're loading cells into the 10x chromium port. Uh, you capture those cells within these gel emulsion beads, uh, and that the cells lyse. The libraries are generated within those individual gems. And then you're, there's amplification within that library, and then you're, uh, then you have a tube effectively, and a tube has effectively um, the the each read, which there's many PCR duplicates, but they have UMIs associated with them, and so you can actually just take an aliquot of of your 10x library, and you can perform the whole mass seq protocol on that aliquot, and in parallel, then run on the exact same cell library your standard short read sequencing that you do, and so effectively then out of the analysis, you'll get cell barcodes from both, both assays that you can very clearly uh, link up to each other. So in this case, I, I principally use the gene expression from, um, from, the, uh, from the short read data, but it's interchangeable effectively with, with what I could use with, uh, with the mass seq, uh, because there's really only a two-fold difference. And it's actually nice in my case to actually be able to validate the gene expression changes between mm -hmm. two orthogonal assays and just make sure there's no you know, technology-specific patch effects. Yeah, and I'll answer a very quick technical question for me, which is how long it takes to make the MOSSEQ library. So from the 10x cDNA, which you've already generated, to sequencing ready, it's two days. And the protocol is in the hands out section. Uh, we have another technical question regarding to SC triangulate. How are you able to compute the Shapley values for these huge data set? What features are considered? Yeah, yeah, so great great question uh, that, that drives drives kind of deeper into that method. So the, the method is, it's published uh, last year, it's in Nature Communications, um, so it's fully open access, uh, fully openly available uh, to read. Um, we, um, we basically tested this approach with uh, up to about 400,000 cells uh, using, um, in some cases, I think the, the max number of modalities we've used so far is maybe four. Um, this may actually be the assay with the most number of modalities we've run here with MassSeq. Uh, in combination with the, the, the site seek. Um, but if you're doing four with hundreds of thousands of cells um, and let's say uh, 10 different annotations, um, it, they, the time to compute the Shapley becomes much uh, longer and longer, the more and more annotations you have. So if you have clusters derived from the splicing, clusters derived from uh, inferred actually clonal populations from the mutations, clusters inferred from the gene expression or from multiple you know, reference single cell atlases, uh, as long as you're below like 15 of those, it will run. After 15, the program actually defaults to, to an alternative algorithm that's much faster, but potentially less accurate. Um, but but it's, uh, you know, the, the author of it wrote it to be fairly efficient. <laughs> All right, got it. And then actually that comes back, now we're in the bioinformatics realm, which is you have presented actually several methods here. Um, I believe I heard cell harmony, um, SC triangulate, and I think there might have been even another one, uh, alt analyze, which was one of the first things that you were uh, using. So my question is, how does your, uh, like what's the recommended bioinformatics workflow after MOSSEQ? Because you did take our SmartLink MOSSEQ output. What are all the things you're using and is that what you would recommend others? So I'm gonna say something controversial. I hate recommended workflows for anything. <laughs> And this is coming from a person who develops workflows, right? I think it's great to run multiple workflows. Um, the whole concept behind this SC triangulate approach is that, you know, there's lots of different alternative interpretations of single cell genomics data. There's many different ways to cluster the data. There's many different prior reference atlases. Uh, we actually encourage people to take all those different annotations and, and treat them as a competition where they find the most robust, durable cell populations defined based on a number of alternative modalities for that. So we think SC triangulate is actually particularly useful for this, but as inputs for SC triangulate, you could use really Surat, you could use ICGS2, you could use um, uh, uh, whatever basically, you know, workflows that you want to identify populations, azimuth, whatever, um, for, for the cell clustering annotations. For imputation, that's a big problem. And that's 
that's something we don't really think is solved in this field. And so literally this is our first, you know, round iterative a reiteration of that that approach. So, you know, we we've actually gotten some somewhat different results. If we actually, um, you know, now include normal healthy CD34 bone marrow cells in with our samples as kind of a ground state truth, we get some different uh, frequencies of wild type calls within these populations uh, where we have tro well types, but then you have a different donor with different genetics and potentially yeah. clonal hematopoiesis if they're age match. So there's lots of different caveats to that. So we really do encourage you to run, I think, multiple different assays. In terms of the splicing analysis, uh, we're arguing that these kind of conventional methods for local splicing variation and based approaches, uh, like Alt Analyze, uh, we think will work probably pretty well. It depends on what your thresholds are for how you're calling these things. Uh, in this case, we're re we've been rewriting Alt Analyze as a Python 3 package that works in the cloud. And so long read support is something that we've been including in this package. And we hope to kind of make something that's a, a bit more streamlined than it currently is. Right now, we're really constructing those pipelines and we're we're hoping to have those available um, later on this year. And actually, that's a great segue into one of the questions, which is you've shown that there's some novel isoforms. And actually, I don't. I don't know if you clarified they were novel, because remember that some of the splicing plots you show, the alternative promoters, they may have may, may or may not have been in the ref C track that you show below, but they could have been in Jenko. My question from the from the uh, audience is if novel isoforms are there, how do you include them in your downstream analysis if they're say missing from the gen code or ref seek annotation? Yeah. And so um so there's a couple different ways. It's a great great question. It's a very good question. It's a very challenging question to answer in general. Um, and, and the reason why is first, you know, so you, it depends on what your reference database is for what your isoforms is and how you're calling those. Um, I believe, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe I'm, if I'm thinking about the right iteration, but that the, um, there are basically annotation functions within the mass seek workflow to say, this is a reference ensemble transcript, ensemble right. transcript one, two, three, four. And you may actually have multiple isoforms that are assigned to the same ensemble transcript. And in those cases, there may be, you know, three prime UTR, five prime UTR differences that result effectively in the same protein coding form, but maybe some novel differences add in the five prime or three prime UTR end. Um, but that is really the, the reference way that you can, if you're looking at the isoform annotations. Um, you know, there are also tools you have to use when you generate these isoform level results for each one of these captures, you have to now merge them. And so there are techniques now to actually you know, identify the most consistent annotation reference structures that are consistent across those different captures. So there's tools that basically say, up oh, this ice form and this capture associates with this ice form and this capture, so we're gonna give them a common unique ID. Um, and so that's an important step in that analysis. Um, what we're doing here in the presentation I gave is to actually is somewhat a little bit initially ignore the full length isoforms and actually just treat the isoforms as a kind of a, a basically a mix of junction, exon exon junctions and exon intron junctions, which you can reliably detect with this protocol. And then we're computing splicing across all these different conditions. Uh, and so in that context, we're looking at, if you're looking at what a novel splicing event is, it's a junction that is not found typically in ensemble is the way that we classify it in our ensemble reference or UCSC uh, genome reference mRNA annotations. Uh, and it has a specific stereotypical kind of annotation where it says novel associated in the name with it. Uh, and so we do initially detect what appear to be a lot of novel isoforms. Um, mm -hmm. I would say, you know, over 50% maybe novel isoforms. Um, in general, when you're looking at these types of data, it's actually best to focus on the known isoform differences first to gain some confidence that these are real because the novel isoforms tend to be expressed more lowly um, and, and are more speculative. So you have to treat them that way. Mm -hmm. And this is a minor technical follow-up to that question, is how do you validate these alternatives, start sites, splicing, or alternative uh, polyadenylation sites that are, oh, by the way, the person said specifically if they're in different cell states that are caused by the variants. I think it's just generally like, how do you know they're real? Yeah, yeah, and, and there can be, you know, batch effects are real, right? And so you theoretically can get, you know, do a capture any kind of sequencing analysis where you capture an RNA species in one set and not another, and you have to confirm whether it's biologically real or some kind of technical artifact, right? And it can be a technical artifact at many different levels of, of the analysis. Um, so, so I always go back to bulk RNA-seq. So if I can have comparable bulk RNA-seq for the same type of disease process that I'm looking at, I'd like to see evidence for it from the bulk RNA-seq. Mm. Uh, 
same for these splicing differences. So there's a ton of bulk RNA seq out there for a lot of different cancers or disease data sets. Um, you can apply deconvolution and say, well, is this predicted clonal cell population in this bulk RNA seq is it you know based on deconvolution? And and then if it is in there, do I see the corresponding you know unique splicing junction calls if you've sequenced deep enough in that bulk RNA seq? And so in that way, you have kind of an orthogonal prediction using an independent laboratory's results and independent technology. Otherwise, it's PCR is the answer. Is, <laughs> yeah, that's you know, right. PCR, QPCR, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually also a great segue into my next question since you talk about bulk and, you know, Nathan, you, and I, you have used both bulk isoseq and now MOSSEQ with single cell. Um, this person's question was, what's a reasonable read length to expect from MOSSEQ using the 10x3 prong kit? Can I capture variants at 1%? That's one, two or three kilobases from the poly A tail. Or can I use my short reads and then impute all the reads, uh, all the clones this way? Like, I think that's my extended question. Like, what are what did you get? by using MOSSEQ that you wouldn't have been able to get out of, you already had it SC triangulate, right? But what is still the current limitation by using Yeah, and so for, for us, you know, I think that the most exciting result is that what I showed here is when we're looking in that lymphoid LMPP population, and we now can actually look at cell populations in which there are, you know, a RUNX1 positive clone, or actually more interesting, a B core positive clone, yeah. or a double positive B core RUNX1 clone. There may have only been like, three or four cells in one capture or 10 cells in one capture that were had that genotype. But with the imputation now, you may actually expand that to dozens of cells or hundreds of cells in some cases. And so now you really can look at those gene expression programs. You can see what are the differences in those populations. And you really can have a functional description of, you know, is there a cell survival benefit in terms of, you know, uh, surviving chemotherapy or, or surviving um, uh, the, the, um, the, the initial MDS therapy? Um, that, that you basically gain by having these additional mutations. So really looking at those gene expression impacts, say, what is the functional relevance of these mutations within specific cell populations that result in very specific gene expression impacts? Yeah, yeah I think that's a good point. So like you're saying is that, okay, even if, you know, 10X doesn't always get me to the exact, but some of them will, like by some chance, I'll see three cells that has the wrong swan mutation, and now I can impute some of the other clones and find out, oh, actually it's there. And instead of three, actually there were 12 cells that started out here, um, which is great. And uh, I actually think that sort of answers the next question is how does ISOSeq overcome these issues for sensitivity of bloaty expressed isoforms and genes, and how does it compare with other sequencing options? And, and that's a great question. I think that's a common challenge you have with with any of these with just doing the the single cell analyses in general. If you have lowly expressed genes or non coding RNAs or you know microRNAs or other you know challenging to detect RNA species, that's really going to be dependent on your kind of base library generation. Uh, and so if you have a library you know preparation protocol that can isolate those, uh, I believe that you know this this mass seq based approach. Uh, should be able to let you go deeper into those uh, results, but it really is dependent on your initial starting uh, library and what's the diversity of RNAs in that library. And actually, just to remind me, the the Revio MOSSEQ data, how many cells was that, those 10x library? Yeah, so, so it varied from about 6,000 to 9,500 cells per capture. So we had three captures that we showed you here. Um, and so, you know, in about like 20, 20 20 some odd thousand cells, yeah. Cool. Or no, um, sorry. Is it? Less than that, sorry, <laughs> I think, yeah. And um, someone asked, are these, what you presented, is this only good for certain malignancies or, you know, blood versus tissue? Yeah, so I think, I think really, if, as far as anything that you can do 10X genomics with, this should work equivalently. Um, so clearly if you're doing neurons, you, you know, you'd have to do NukeSeq. So I don't know what the answer on NukeSeq is, that's a Liz question um, mm -hmm. for this, and and similarly, if you have you know uh, you know certain embedded tissues which are archival and have to isolate those, I think you again go back to the kind of the 10x library preparation methods. That was a question online. Um, so Liz again will probably be able to answer that a bit more better better yeah. than I can. Yeah, and I would actually say sometimes the way I like to answer is is, is it really depends on what the 10x uh, chromium is able to generate. And the limitation for what we can sequence will probably be somewhat contingent. Same thing with bulk isoseq. Actually, you know, people used to ask me, can you, can you, can I sequence a 15 kilobase transcript? And my answer usually is, can you make a 15 kb cDNA? Because if you're able to um, 
you know, create a 15 kilobase cDNA, then usually PacBio doesn't have a problem sequencing it. And I think the same goes with 10X. It's like, as long as their system is able to process your, your tissue, your blood and sample to generate high quality single cell cDNA, then by all means, it will work with the Mossy kit. All right, so we are at time. If there are any remaining questions, we do see, uh, we'll follow up with you later. You will get a recording. When you exit the webinar, you'll be asked to fill up a survey. We'd really appreciate if you do. And once again, thank you, Nathan, for joining me for this live session today. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Bye, everyone.